Welcome to this afternoon session on the all-volunteer force at 50. My name is Kate Kuzminski, and I'm the senior fellow and program director for the Military Veterans and Society program here at CNAS. We focus on military personnel policy, issues facing military families and veterans, and civil military relations. In essence, our program focuses on the human elements of warfare and national security. We also seek to educate the broader defense establishment on the ways in which our military personnel policies are directly tied to the US military's readiness and lethality. Far from being a soft science, the study, development, and implementation of the ways in which we select, train, educate, retain, evaluate, promote, and manage our military personnel provides a distinct competitive advantage against would-be adversaries. They can attempt to replicate our technology or study our operations, but they cannot replicate the professionalism and will to fight present in the American service member. If there's any doubt that the human element of warfare is essential to our nation's security, it's worth noting that we're having this conversation today, June 6, 2023, on the 79th anniversary of D-Day. While the hardware of the war, the C-47s, the machine go guns, the Higgins boats, were important, it was the combination of the skill, courage, and will of American troops that proved essential. It's not the 3,000 landing craft or 2,500 ships that we think of when we think of D-Day, but rather the image of the young service member, equal parts terrified and resolved, wading through the water toward a nearly impossible mission or the airborne soldier of the 82nd or 101st clutching the line as they prepare to jump into the unknown. That not only stands out in American memory, but it elicits an emotional response. It's also the result of the expertise, training, and experience of the military planners and strategists, most notably General Eisenhower, and their qualities of leadership that were selected for, trained, and educated over a career of service. We're also approaching a second important anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. On July 1st, 1973, after years of analysis and debate, Secretary of Defense Mel Laird announced that the United States military would fill its ranks exclusively from volunteers rather than conscripts. Though it should also be noted that the creation of the ABF still requires the infrastructure of an effective stand-in draft in case of national emergency. The AVF provided some distinct advantages, in particular, the professionalism of the force. There were also concerns at the inception of the AVF. Would it be too expensive? Would it cause the creation of a separate warrior caste, disconnected from broader society? Would society pay less attention to our use of force decisions if the AVF didn't seemingly affect them? Who would serve when not all serve? We've taken the all-volunteer force through the Gulf War and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We witnessed the adaption from a conventional force uh, in the 90s to a counterinsurgency force in the 2000s. The services are currently investing heavily in ensuring the strength of the all-volunteer force in deterring and, if necessary, fighting and winning the nation's wars against a near-peer adversary, as reflected in the national defense strategies of 2018 and 2022. Here at CNAS, we've been leading a task force on the all-volunteer force at 50, examining the levers and mechanisms the military services use to recruit, retain, and train our service members and, their, uh, and retain their families. We're wrestling with questions of how the services can best access the talent necessary to sustain the all-volunteer force, and whether some of those mechanisms might need to be modernized in a new era. So, joining me today, are the three people, three civilians responsible um, in the military departments for managing all of these questions and the burden that comes along with it. I'm thrilled to be joined by the Assistant Secretaries of Manpower and Reserve Affairs for the Army, Navy, and Air Force, uh, a full house. Um, Mr. Alex Wagner uh, at the end, uh, the MNRA for the Air Force, Mr. Franklin Parker of the Navy, and Dr. Agnes Schaefer of the Army. Along with their three-star uniform counterparts, the G1, A1, and N1, 
The, oh, they oversee the development and impl implementation of the whole gamut of human capital, including civilians and our uniformed service members. So with that, I'd like to introduce the three of you um, and kind of pose a scene setting question up top, which is the all volunteer force provided us with a certain number of um, advantages um, and also potentially some challenges. So can you speak to uh, how the all volunteer force affects your military department and the services under that? So I will start with Dr. Schaefer. Hi everyone, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here um, and there's lots of friendly familiar faces in the crowd so thanks for having me, this is really wonderful. Um, and thank you to my buddies here, the three of us are a, a tight-knit group. We're dealing with similar challenges and we just make a really, really wonderful team and I'm honored to serve with them um, every day. So um, I think you hit on the tension between um, you know, the advantages and challenges of an all-volunteer force. Um, I mean, I think you know, the professionalism, professionalism um, diversity of experiences and perspectives are absolutely um, advantages, um, but there are some, some challenges as well. I would say um, what we're seeing in, in the recruiting um, challenge in, in the Army, and this is specific to us, it's historical, um, we are now seeing large swaths of the country that just aren't familiar with the Army. And this is largely due to the fact that we bracked a lot of installations in the northern part of the country. Um, in the 80s, so folks don't see neighbors who are um, in the military. They don't see folks walking down the street in uniform. Um, and so we are seeing a, a really big and growing um, cultural knowledge um, gap about the military. Um, and so what we're doing is we're trying to, to fill that. Um, and so that, to me, that is, um, sort of the, the biggest thing that I'm worried about. Just that it, it's amazingly after 20 years of war, we have a country that really doesn't know its military. Mr. Parker. All right, great, thank you very much. And also it, it really is a pleasure to be here today and also again to, to be here with my counterparts as well. I mean, it's a great team and tight knit group and that, that, that's very much appreciated, especially given the common work we do and the common challenges we face. Um, with respect to your question about kind of benefits and challenges of the all-volunteer force, I think one of the real benefits is there's that opportunity to have a closer match between mission and interests and, um, and the mission and cultures of the organizations that we each have. You know, not everyone's cut out to be a sailor, not everyone's cut out to be a Marine, but in the all-volunteer force, given the self-selecting aspect to it, um, you, you know, people have the opportunity to choose for themselves where they want to go. Um, and I think that's one of the great things in terms of bringing folks in. I think also over time, we've developed an, uh, an, an ability to better assess um, kind of what attributes and qualities and types of folks will, will have better potential to succeed within our respective services as well, and really to provide career paths for those individuals. And so I think those are some of the positives of having an all-volunteer force as we do today. Um, I think with respect to challenges, though, it's, it's very similar to, to some of the things that Dr. Schaefer mentioned um, um, that we're experiencing in the Navy and Marine Corps as well. You know, for the all-volunteer force, one of the biggest challenges is that we're subject to market forces. Basically, we are in general competition with private sector, with other public sector entities for talent. And so if people are deciding whether or not they want to go to the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, they're also deciding that against other opportunities they have in their lives, whether to go to another federal government agency, whether to go to a private sector company or what have you. So we always need to remain, um, remain relevant um, and we always really need to communicate to folks what that return on investment will be for them you know, of their service in the military and that really can be a challenge. Mr. Wagner. Well, I just want to associate myself uh, both with the remarks of thanking CNAS and uh, each other and being here together, but also uh, with the substance that my colleagues just said. When I think about the value of the all-volunteer force over what preceded it, I think of a force that is closer to the American people than our politics today uh, present. We learn about where young people are today 
faster and better than the social scientists because we're forced to deal with this. We are pulling people, the best of our society, into our force, learning about what they value, getting a better understanding of where they want to go. And we, for the most part, have the ability to adapt and make changes because of our broad authorities and because of the critical importance of our mission. The challenge that I see today is, is one that's very real, and it includes uh, market forces. I mean, right now we have record low unemployment and record high wage growth, and so we are competing for talent with the private sector. But there's also something that uh, neither of you have mentioned, which is, which is a real concern to me, and it's political polarization. And historically, the military has been that one part of our society, that one part of, um, of our national fabric that united disparate parts of our body politic. And today, extremes uh, from both ends are looking at our military and using it as a way to champion their small, uh, partisan, extreme politics. And I think that that has the power to rend the American people, those who are protected, even further away from those who are doing the protection. And that's what really worries me. And that's, that's one of the things that we have been battling uh, to try to talk about the value of service um, the, the mission of service and the role that the people that comprise the armed forces today play in distinguishing us and offering a strategic advantage over our near peer competitors. So as you've all touched on, the recruiting challenges have been headlines in the news and not just in our small community of people who, of defense watchers, right? This is the New York Times, the Washington Post, the service secretaries had a joint uh, um, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal addressing this and addressing the influencers in the community. Um, and so when we look at, um, at recruitment, there's, there's two pieces of the Venn diagram, right? There's the ability to meet standards and there's propensity or this awareness and desire to serve. Um, and both of those have to be present in order for us to recruit a force. Um, the Army has taken a really um, different approach in um, hitting on the preparation side when it comes to helping individuals meet the standards who are propense but might otherwise be barred from service. So can you talk to us, uh, Dr. Schaefer, a little bit about the uh, future Army prep, future soldier prep course um, and the, the outcomes that you're currently seeing? Yeah, sure. I, I love to talk about the future soldier prep course um, because the intent was to do exactly what you just talked about, thread the needle, right? Um, so we wanted to open the aperture um, to folks who were not quite at the, at the um, they're, they're still qualified but not in those upper categories, um, to help them um, get to standard. Um, and in particular, we were noticing that particularly after um, COVID, kids were not um, doing well in terms of test scores um, and physical fitness. Um, so we developed a program that has two tracks, physical and uh, academic. Um, and uh, what we're finding is that uh, there's 97% graduation rates. Um, we've had about 6,000 kids or 6,000 uh, uh, recruits coming through the program. Um, and I think that uh, this has been seen by Congress as well as some of the other services um, as a way to kind of thread that needle. Um, so it's only been in place for about 10 months. So what I am, um, am extremely um, curious to see is how they will do over the long term. And Congress is very interested in that as well as the other services. So we will see um, kind of the long term effects, but my job is to make sure that we protect um, the data um, of that first cohort coming through so we can measure this uh, longitudinally. Um, so um, we are very, very curious to see what happens after they get to their first um, assignment um, and beyond. So thinking about uh, recruitment, um, Alex, you are in a really unique position. So for those of you who don't know, the Department of the Air Force is over both the Air Force as a service and the establishment of the Space Force. 
Um, so you have to really think about building a service from the ground up. What does that look like? Um, and what are some of the maybe more innovative ways that the Department of the Air Force has been able to approach the development of this new service? Thanks, Kate. Uh, I, I did want to emphasize uh, that we are a two-service military department. And that offers uh, a number of real advantages, uh, particularly as we imagine what a new service looks like uh, in the 21st century. Uh, to answer your question, uh, the Space Force uh, is a very different model for service, uh, far, far different than the traditional uh, requirements of you know, jumping out of airplanes or flying airplanes uh, or, or, or navigating hostile terrain. Uh, the mission that Guardians perform every day is incredibly important to protecting our modern way of war. And many of you understand it as protecting our modern way of life, whether it's uh, via the GPS system, uh, whether it's taking an Uber or getting a date off of Tinder. Uh, our cell phones are integral into how we now work in this world. And similarly, uh, communications and technology and missile warning and tracking is integral into how we fight wars in the 21st century. But the way that they serve is different, and it's often enabled by computers and through technology. And so we don't have to have exactly the same both talent management process, uh, a session process, um, and, um, and physical uh, testing process. So earlier this month, uh, we announced that Guardians now have the option to opt in to an Air Force Research Lab pilot program for a holistic health assessment. So what does that mean? That means that instead of once a year or twice a year getting ready to take a PT test and making sure that your height and your weight and uh, your body conform to what was within standard, uh, we would have continuous the option for continuous fitness monitoring. So those people who aren't necessarily required to meet a certain physical standard to do that job would still be allowed to have a healthy force. So we're gonna see over the next two years how this works. Of course, folks are always welcome and still have the option to take the Air Force PT test. I took it myself a couple weeks ago. Um, it wasn't that tough. Uh, and it, to me, it didn't, it didn't get to why we do this, which is to maintain a healthy, resilient force. So one way is through technology. A different way is talent management. Um, we're looking at a system and working right now with Congress to hopefully, since Guardians aren't necessarily always deployed abroad or into war zones, they're often deployed in place, say, well, how can we talent manage in a way that will allow people to have more of a work-life harmony? If you've got a sick relative that you needed to take care of, maybe you can go from a full-time status to a part-time status. Maybe you wanna be with your kids over the last two years of high school instead of uh, focused solely on the job. And so you can go from full-time to part-time. And then when that situation resolves, go back to full-time. We've gotta be able to get a different type of person who is propensed to serve, but might see themselves as not willing to do the, the stereotypical military model in order to get the kind of talent the Space Force needs to win and thrive in the 21st century. And I think that is what we're looking at things differently, managing talent based on competencies rather than years and bars. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things I'd be excited to talk about, but I don't wanna take the whole panel doing so. So we think a lot about recruitment, but we also think a lot about retention, and that also includes affiliation, so those leaving active duty and entering the reserve component, uh, keeping those skills within the big army or the big air force or the big navy, but not necessarily on active duty. Um, so for, for each of you, I'll ask, um, what does the retention picture look like? Because I think it's a different story that we're seeing on retention than we're seeing on uh, recruitment um, and, and go from there. So I will start with Mr. Parker. Excellent. I know for the Navy and Marine Corps, the retention picture is looking quite good. Um, I know there have been a number of initiatives in recent years to improve retention in both services, and that's really core to the force structure of each. 
and we've we've pulled a number of levers to really try to make that happen. Uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, we've looked at a number of different ways to really encourage um, um, earlier reenlistment opportunities, or really really improve reenlistment opportunities for folks. Um, we've also offered special incentive pays to keep people in the force as well. And similarly, um, in Navy, we've done a similar type of thing, both with special incentive plays, also removing high year tenure for a number of, of positions um, and various other efforts. Another real focus has been on quality of life, really looking at the quality of life that we're offering to our service members, because that's a really, again, going back to the notion of the all-volunteer force and really being in competition for talent, quality of life's a really key discriminator for folks, whether to um, come into the service and whether to stay. And so we've really been trying to look at it holistically through all those angles, and we've seen a good picture. Um, our retention is very high, and we're also meeting or exceeding our, our, our reenlistment goals as well. Go to Dr. Schaefer. Well, thankfully, our um, retention rates are also very high, at historical highs, actually. Um, and so what I, I do worry about keeping that shored up, though. Um, I don't want that to slide. So we're using the same sorts of levers that I think we're using across the services, including bonuses, uh, quality of life is a, a, a huge priority for us. Um, that includes everything from barracks to work-life balance, CDCs. Um, a huge priority for me is, is uh, permeability, so this ability to move across the components um, as your life changes, like Alex alluded to. Um, you know, you may want to go out from the active component and go to the guard or the reserve. Um, you may want to be settled for a little bit, right, as your, your kids are in school. Um, this is, this, uh, these are the kinds of things that this generation is looking for. Uh, and I think we need to listen to those cues. Um, and so permeability, um, quality of life kinds of issues are, are, are high on both the secretary and my, my mind. So Mr. Wagner, uh, two questions for you. One, following on to their answer. But two, you have a unique challenge in the Air Force, particularly among the pilot community and some of the other AFSCs, maintainers. Right, there's a high demand for those skills outside. Um, so how, how is retention in the Air Force, and then also specifically, how are you dealing with uh, the retention of those highly skilled, uh, high investment individuals that we have in the Air Force? So I would just tackle the broader retention question by saying, and affiliating myself with what my colleagues said, um, we're about 90% retention uh, at key intervals uh, between officers and enlisted in the Department of the Air Force. Uh, and what does that tell us? That tells us that once people join, they want to stay. But increasingly, we are in competition with the private sector. We've got to be an employer of choice. And that's not only an employer of choice for the member, but also for their dependents. And so all of these quality of life issues are not tangential to our mission. They are at the core of what it means to have a ready and resilient force. And so I take all of these things, whether it be spouse employment, child care, housing, very, very seriously. Uh, because this decision, whether or not to stay, is not necessarily exclusively a financial one, although I will get to that. Uh, but it is what type of lifestyle and what are the values and opportunities of a military life that we don't talk about enough, we don't uh, help often, in many cases, our members understand all of those benefits that they have versus the private sector. And how do we find a way to both transmit this to the American people, but then also to ensure that our force knows? So specifically with financial incentives, listen, I mean, people come and serve for a variety of reasons, and financial stability is one of those. But uh, I am overall skeptical of, um, of the value of these short one-time bonuses. That said, last week the Department of the Air Force made an announcement that we would go up to $50,000 a year to retain uh, some of our critical pilots. Uh, you know, when I came into the job and when I testified at my confirmation hearing, I was prepared to answer questions about the pilot shortage. And at the time, I thought that the shortage was on the front end and that we just didn't have enough people being interested in pilots, being a pilot. 
That was completely wrong. We have a number of challenges, whether it be um, developing those pilots, whether it be absorbing those pilots into the broader Air Force, and then uh, retaining those pilots. And just to unpack what Frank noted uh, about competition with the private sector, and I'll end on this. As I understand, in the last year, the airlines hired more pilots than they did in the previous three years combined. So we've got to realize that we are not only in competition with ourselves to make sure that we provide a competitive pay structure, that we provide incredible opportunities, that we allow pilots to do what they love, which is fly and not burn them down with a bunch of other responsibilities, but also that they're being recruited away from, a, from, us, from us from the private sector in, in many ways that they can offer more competitive compensation and more stability but I think we're always gonna win when it comes to mission. And I think we've gotta emphasize that and allow those people to, to do their job and to do what they love at the highest level because that not only allows us to retain that talent, that allows America's Air Force to succeed into, into deterring, denying, and when necessary, defeating our adversaries. Yeah, I think you raise a number of good points in that. Um, and we see it particularly, so some of these are items are more pronounced in the Air Force, um, in the pilot community, and in some of the more technical skill sets in all the services. Um, but thinking about the timing of service commitments and when people want to have families, or uh, there's, there's a range of life choices that are being made, um, not just purely the financial incentives. Um, Compensation's important, don't get me right. wrong. <laughs> but, it, but it is one part of a decision-making process that includes dependence, that includes quality of life, that includes, uh, are you doing what you love? Are you focused on the mission in the way that we told you you'd be focused when we assessed you? Yeah, and, and another thing that that raises too is a recommendation that I think most think tanks have, have made in the past about um, exit interview data and, and making sure we're capturing that. And I think our unit level commanders know the reasons why their people might be leaving, or maybe they don't, um, but there is an always a central repository to know uh, where, why people are getting out and what incentives might have actually uh, helped them to stay. And really thinking about some of the non-monetary incentives, so some stability or um, other, other facets that have nothing to do with a bonus that might actually keep someone in. Um, so Mr. Parker, uh, specifically, so again, as, as Mr. Wagner has two services in his department, you've got two services in yours, and you alluded to this earlier, but the Marine Corps is currently um, rethinking a little bit the way that it balances between the churn of new recruits and retaining some experience and talent, and that's directly tied to the requirements that we see the Marine Corps filling uh, in potential future conflict. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what some of those initiatives are and perhaps what the other services could take away from, from um, shifting from uh, relying heavily on brand new recruits to rebalancing the, the relationship between recruited and retained individuals? Oh, absolutely, thank you. Uh, you know, and the Marine Corps is, you know, in, in, in the process of a bit of a transformation in terms of its work structure and also talent management techniques. And that's really to make sure the Marine Corps' mission um, um, stays up to date with the, with the evolving challenges that we face in the 21st century and 21st century um, conflict environment. You know, the Marine Corps has a long and storied history and it also has a very unique mission within the services. And I think that's one of the things that's really driven some of the relooks at the way things are being done. You know, on the talent management side, and I think really going to your point, um, historically, the Marine Corps has had a very high level of churn really at um, the junior enlisted ranks. You know, a lot of attrition early on for folks, you know, getting in for one enlistment, getting out, and so on. And so, you know, what, uh, what, what the Marine Corps is really trying to do is take a look at people, you know, not, not as inventory, but as individuals and really finding a way to maximize the return on investment in our folks. You know, Marine Corps understands that in the future we're going to need folks who are much more highly technically competent and will require increased skill sets as well. We also need to make sure that, we've, that we retain some of the more um, seasoned Marines that we have in the force and we keep that talent and that experience within the force as well. And so that's also something that the Corps is intentionally trying to do. So there are a few ways they're trying to do it. 
you know, on the front end, really trying to look at ways to improve reenlistment, reenlistment opportunities, whether that's allowing for earlier reenlistment, whether that's allowing for um, pre-approval of reenlistment, um, whether, th whether that's providing um, incentives for various special, uh, special duty assignments and so on, really trying to look at those types of ways to, to keep people in at that earlier stage. And then when they're in, investing in them more, providing the training that they can provide to them to make sure that they have uh, you know, the, the technical skill sets that they're really going to need to be an effective force in the future. And then for our more seasoned folks, again, trying to find ways to continue to help them improve, whether that's through educational opportunities, whether that's through enhanced use of 360 mechanisms and so on to really do um, assessments of their leadership abilities. And, and as, as my, my colleague Alex mentioned before, really key competencies to really lead, um, to really lead um, a diverse and inclusive force in the future. Um, and then in addition to that, looking at other level levers such as those special incentive pays and quality of life factors, really to keep the people in who we've had just so we can make sure that we're retaining that expertise in the force as well. So Marine Corps is really looking at it at both ends to really make sure we're maximizing that investment in our people right now. And, and a few of you have touched on this shift to talent management um, from, uh, and I know a lot of the, the uniform folks who work on, on talent management hate when we say, you know, from an industrial model into a more talent management model, but that is essentially what it was, right? We're moving from a model of interchangeable parts, which were necessary for the military requirements of the time, to a more um, technical force uh, or a force that is where we're training the right person for the right role with the right skill sets at the right time. Um, and that's a huge undertaking. Um, so I, I'd like to ask each of you to touch on some of the efforts that are underway in your service and also to highlight a lot of times when we talk about talent management, we're only talking about officers. But I think there are some initiatives underway in each of your departments that are taking a look at how we think about talent management when it comes to the enlisted force, which makes up nearly 80, 85% depending on the service. Um, so I will start with Dr. Schaefer. So uh, one of my main priorities when I came into this position was modernization of our post-industrial system. And I'm, I'm talking about that in a historic sense um, because it really has been that long since we've actually re-looked it. Um, so modernization of our, our po policies, our processes, our systems, and talent management is absolutely key um, to that. And as some of you may know, I wasn't ran for 16 years before I took this position and I had done a lot of work actually with Kate um, on some of these talent management issues. So. Um, now that I am sitting in this seat um, and seeing um, all of the really wonderful work, the ta our talent management task force was really sort of a front runner um, in the department, um, breaking glass in terms of talent management, um, and in particular trying to match um, skills, knowledge, abilities um, with positions. Um, and so we have done that on the officer side um, and we are now starting to do that on the, the enlisted side too with our sergeant major assessment program, which is complementary to the command assessment um, program at the officer level. Um, but I have, I have been pushing um, the task force to think more about um, the enlisted population as well. Again, because we, we're, we're gonna need flexibilities like we have gotten in the um, 2018 and 2019 and more recent NDAAs to be able to move people around um, and to give them the flexibility um, to move around. I, I worry that the incredibly siloed system that we have right now um, is outdated. Um, we need to move more towards a jungle gym um, type of a system um, where people can move around, again, depending on life circumstances, where they wanna move. Um, and right now, I'm building the Army of 2030 and 2040. Um, and in order to be able to build the Army of 2040 in particular, I, I need to start shaping the force now, right? Um, and so thinking about what kind of skill sets we're gonna need in 2040, um, what kind of folks we need to bring in and, and our training pipeline to be able to get to um, the skill sets and the training required for that uh, 2040. So um, we will continue to make this a priority. Um, as we um, continue, especially 
um, as we think about you know the recruiting crisis again, um, it, it, it sort of weaves its way through all of the things that we're talking about. But um, we are looking at the folks that we're able to bring in, right? And how do we, again, make the, the Army an employer of choice um, among the vast uh, choices that, that pe pe people have right now in the private sector? Mr. Parker? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our, our enlisted force is the majority of our force. And so our talent management efforts fundamentally need to include our, our enlisted service members as well. You know, I was talking um, previously about Marine Corps talent management efforts. And you know, as you might have noticed, a, a big chunk of what I talked about was specifically geared towards our enlisted service members. On the Navy side, we're trying to do a similar type of thing also. We're looking at our assignment processes to, to find ways to get folks to re-enlist in, in sea duty occupations and provide folks with incentives to do so. Um, we're also um, looking at programs to identify talent, identify enlisted talent and provide them with opportunities to succeed. We have a MAP program that really encourages commands to identify folks who they view as high performers to help provide them with those opportunities. We have another program, the ATP program, Advanced to Position, where um, we provide incentives for folks to take on hard jobs, hard assignments that not only meet the needs of the Navy, but also provide them with advancement opportunities in the future. Um, another thing that we feel very strongly about, and I know our secretary really has championed, is the Naval Community College, and that's something we stood up over the past year. And it's, it's geared specifically towards our enlisted service members, and it allows them the opportunity to get associate's degrees, but also professional credentials in other areas that are specific to, to, to their warfighting duties that will help them operationally be better warfighters, but at the same time will help provide them with skills and credentials that will help support and advance them throughout their careers as well. Mr. Wagner. So the bottom line is that the Air Force and, of course, the Space Force are a high-tech force. And in a high-tech force, you've got to be able to retain that talent. Um, Frank just mentioned uh, the Navy's Community College. Uh, I'm proud to say that the Community College of the Air Force is the largest community college in the world. Um, and people often think that, that the military is an alternative to education. Well, in the Department of the Air Force, I can tell you that, that, that we are not an alternative to education, we're a pathway to education. With regard to specific initiatives, uh, I, if you've been following the news in the last month, we've been trying to increase flexibility and make our, our processes closer to what America's Gen Z uh, and other generations expect from employers today. And so just recently we announced as of 1 June a new uh, program where you can cross train uh, at the end of your first term of enlistment into a different Air Force specialty code. So maybe you showed up at the recruiting station and this one was filled and this one was filled and you, filled and you took this one. Instead of saying, well, it didn't really work out, uh, we're going to allow those first-term airmen to, to switch into uh, an undermanned uh, specialty code, irrespective of the manning of the code that they're currently in. On the opposite side of things, we wanted to increase flexibilities, and so we also recently announced a program, along with my battle buddy, uh, Chief uh, Sergeant Major of the Air Force, mm -hmm. Joanne Bass, where uh, airmen are going to be allowed to go into uh, our My Vector system and find airmen in that same specialty code and possibly switch assignments. Uh, so maybe you, you want to go here and someone else would prefer to go there. So enhancing these flexibilities, making our system more modern and more reactive and receptive to today's uh, not only young people, but but the way Americans expect their employer to be. Uh, this is how we maintain our ability to be an employer of choice. And the enlisted force is, you know, is at the front edge of operating and maintaining these highly exquisite platforms that provide our Air Force with its decisive edge. And, and making sure we retain that high-tech talent is core to my responsibility and what we see as our mission uh, fundamental to our readiness. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, I'm going to turn back to you because I think there's two initiatives that the Army has that stand out among the services. One is the, the command assessment programs that you, you spoke to, um, and the, the other is similar to the platform that, that uh, Mr. Wagner was 
was speaking to you in the Air Force, there's the AIM module, which has really changed the way that assignments are done in the Army. So could you speak to those two elements of managing Army personnel? Uh, I mean, I think both of these, again, um, the, the command assessment program in particular, um, it really tries to identify those folks who are ready for command, because um, not everybody is ready at the same time. But we have this system that right, pushes, has been pushing folks up um, as part of the process. So um, it, it was interesting because I was able to take, uh, I was able to observe a, a CAP assessment a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was actually very similar to um, an executive leader training um, session that I had when I was at RAND. Um, and you know, the, your, you get assess, you do your own assessment of yourself, and then you get assessments from peers and subordinates. Um, and it's just really interesting to see what you're good at and what they think you're good at, and vice versa, um, and where those uh, converge and diverge. Um, but it was it was really interesting, um, you know. We and then they sort of go through an interview process um, with folks to see if they're ready for command. And we have weeded people out and told them to hold off a year or two um, because you're not quite ready. Um, and I think it, the feedback that we've gotten is that they they don't necessarily appreciate it at first when they hear that, um, but they do say, you know, looking back on it, I wasn't ready, so it was probably good that I didn't move on to command. Um, and then um, we're doing all kinds of things, including AIM, um, to like talent management branching, right? These kinds of things where we're giving people more agency um, in the choices that they make um, to manage their own careers, which they haven't been able to do before because they've been in this industrial model where they, they, they're on a track and that's, that's the track they're going on. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, General McGee, who was running the Talent mm -hmm. Management Task Force at the time, and General McConville, who at the time was the G1, now Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, wrote some initial pilot results of VCAP. And it was interesting to see that um, some people who in due course in the old system would have kind of automatically been the person mm -hmm. you'd assume would be in command were actually not landing that way, and also uh, individuals who have some of the professional skills that maybe don't get captured in the evaluation system, mm -hmm. and actually, you know, they're a really compelling leader, we're rising to the top, so it's interesting mm -hmm. to see how, how that's changing the, the dynamics there. Um, so you've all touched on elements of quality of life issues for the force, and certainly, I would imagine, in your offices, those are the things you're most concerned when they go wrong, right? Those are the things that are most likely to be the front page of the newspaper. Um, but you're doing so many proactive things when it comes to quality of life issues for the force. Um, so I'd like for each of you uh, to just highlight one of the, the things that your department is doing um, and the, perhaps the outcomes that you're seeing related to that. So I will start with Mr. Park. Excellent, thank you. And, and this is an area that's, that's fundamentally important to us. And I've talked about a focus on quality of life from a recruitment and retention standpoint, how the Marine Corps is really putting a focus on it with respect to its talent management uh, 2030 initiatives as well. But another area in which we're really focusing on it is quality of service. And that's really that intersection between quality of life and the quality of someone's experience at work, experience performing their role. And this is something we've been highly sensitized to, especially in light of some of the things we've seen on the Navy side um, with some of our folks who've been in long-term um, 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 refueling and complex, and complex overhaul um, situations in our shipyards. And when we've had folks in those environments for long periods of time, we've seen an increase in mental health challenges and we've seen a number of sailor suicides. And so this is something we're taking very seriously and we're very focusing on from a quality of service standpoint. And so what do I really mean by that? Well, it's, it's really trying to look at those things that will help improve quality of life but also make that person's experience in their role a bit easier. And so that can be looking at things like parking access. It can be look at, looking at access to Wi-Fi. It can be looking at um, housing arrangements and, and, and where are folks living and really what are the quality um, of those arrangements. It can be looking at access to mental health services and how hard are they to get to and so on. And so we're really trying to, it can be access to MWR. And if someone especially is in those types of environments, what outlets mm -hmm. do they have? And what opportunities do they have for connection to, to others in the service and building a sense of community? 
So we're really trying to take a holistic look from a quality of service perspective. And it can be things that you might not even think about. And so it can be things on the IT side, you know, working through some of the IT challenges. Because if you have a whole number of things going on, maybe the last thing you need is you come into the office, you have a project, you got something you're trying to push, and your computer won't boot up. And so, you know, really trying to look holistically at where are those things where maybe we can move the needle a little bit in terms of proving our sailors and Marines experience, which can really make a big difference, you know, not only in their quality of life, but in their quality of service as well. Alex? So, Kate, I'm worried about kids. Uh, and I'm worried about kids because if folks, members are thinking and concerned about the experience their kids are having, they're not going to be focused on their jobs. They're not going to be focused on their mission. And part of our responsibility is not only taking care of the member, but taking care of their entire family. Uh, and so when I hear stories of racism in schools, when I hear uh, requests, when I get requests, when I'm forced to move families from installations because their school will do nothing when their LGBT kid is being bullied, uh, that worries me because that's distracting from the mission, that's detracting from our readiness. And I'm also thinking about childcare. Uh, and when I came into this job a year ago, uh, we were paying in the Department of the Air Force at, at nearly every single installation more than the local community was paying for childcare. And you're right, after the coronavirus pandemic, this is a national issue. Childcare shortages, staffing is a national issue. So I said to our team, well, what, what can we do to increase staffing? And so we have recruiting and retention incentives. Uh, we worked uh, with the Secretary of Defense as part of his Taking Care of People initiative. All the services did. He rolled out a incentive for, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna offer you a discount if you, uh, if you wanna be a child care provider at one of our CDCs and your child will get a 50% discount. Well, we crunched the numbers in the Department of the Air Force and we said, we're gonna go to 100%. So uh, your first child, you can get 100% discount on and your second and third, et cetera, child will give you a 25% discount. And I wanted to see if those types of programs, those incentive programs, uh, enhance access to fa family child care homes and, um, and recruiting and retention incentives made a difference. And I'm pleased to report that they have. Uh, last year at this time, our uh, staffing was at 65%. And right before I came over here, the numbers I got was we've moved the needle to 76%. So these things are making a difference. Uh, the reason why people want to have their kids in our childcare system is because it's world class, because our providers are better vetted than the local community, uh, they're in places that are convenient, and their kids are getting a great experience with similarly situated kids. I'm incredibly proud of our childcare services, and our main goal right now is to enhance staffing mm -hmm. so that everybody who wants to take a part of Air Force childcare has that ability and opportunity to, so they can stay focused on their mission. Dr. Schaefer. So they stole a bunch of my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would just say, um, overall, I think, um, you know, we are taking a similar approach to what Frank mentioned, thinking of this very holistically. Um, and in particular, um, I, I'm thinking of, you know, these work-life balance kinds of issues like childcare, um, spouse employment, spousal employment, um, things like that. Um, but I would also say that um, we we're also looking at barracks. Um, you know, I think all of the same issues, same kinds of um, issues that we are um, thinking about. Right, and I, I just jump on that. Um, every single member of all of our force is a brand ambassador to their friends, to their families, to influencers, mm -hmm. to their communities. And when we give them a great experience, that will help close this this growing familiarity gap. You know, when uh, I was growing up, about 40%, because of the conscription force, 40% of uh, Americans had a parent who served. Today, that number is around 13% and dropping. Uh, and so we've got to focus on how we bridge this familiarity gap, which, which in my mind is the most critical factor and maintaining the health of the all-volunteer force, maintaining the interest in service, and ensuring that our larger body politic is healthy. 
if I could just um, follow up on one thing. So, uh, you know, we've been also concerned about remote and isolated areas. Um, so one of the things that we have been using as a lever is um, station of choice um, instead of incentives. Um, in some cases, we are offering incentives as well. Um, but we are finding that station of choice is, is one of the, is the top um, of these sort of options that people choose. Um, which I think is interesting. Um, and Alaska, of all places, is, is the top station of choice. Um, so some people want to go to um, you know, remote and isolated places, um, but they, it's different when you're forced to go, right? Um, so again, we're getting back to this issue of having some sort of agency um, over your career. And I think this gets a quality of life. For sure. I, yeah, I think uh, what we've seen over the last 20 years in the research bears out that you know, those non-monetary incentives are really important. And they're also much harder to track, uh, right? We know exactly how many people are taking the financial incentives, and we're starting to track these non-monetary ones. I think it's agency, and it's also information, and not just for the service member. It's also information for the receiving unit um, that they may not have been receiving before. I remember, you know, in the Army, you used to just get a list of five installations, please rank order them. You didn't know what job it was, you didn't know what unit it was, um, so I think it, it works for both the service member and the service. Um, so as we approach the, the closing time of our conversation here, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time trying to plead the case of, of why personnel policy is fundamentally the linchpin on which our readiness and our lethality rests. Um, how do you each describe the relationship between how we manage our people and what our lethal advantage is? And I'll start at the end and work our way down. Well, the one thing that I haven't had the opportunity and we haven't had the opportunity to discuss uh, today is the critical importance of a diverse and an inclusive force. And the three of us recently had to testify on that. But uh, what I would say about diversity and inclusion and why it is core to our national security is not only because diversity is a normative good thing. It's not only because we want to reach the talent wherever it is that we might not have traditionally been able to reach, but it's really about the science of diversity. And what the science of diversity says is that randomly selected teams of diverse individuals outperform, outperform carefully selected teams of homogenous individuals. And why is that? It, well, it's easy. When you bring together people with a variety of different experiences, they problem solve differently. And what I need managing the Department of the Air Force's personnel enterprise is a diverse force that thinks about how to approach the hardest, toughest, most challenging national security issues, challenging issues, period, that this country faces bringing them together with a single focus, with a single mission, and leveraging that power. That power of an all-volunteer, diverse, talented, expert force, and using that as a weapon system to distinguish ourselves from our competitors. That's at the core of what we do. The United States of America leverages its talents maximizes those talents uh, and then puts them, as I said, to deter, to deny, and where necessary, defeat. Um, and so it hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't had an opportunity to discuss this yet, but I am so proud of our many efforts to deliberately and intentionally engender a diverse force that is bound together by a sense of mission, and purpose where everyone can bring their full self every single day to the job and build a stronger team as a result. Mr. Parker. Excellent, thank you. And, and really, for, for, you know, it's for, a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Well, 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 further to your comments, Alex, I mean, we have a tremendously talented nation, and as a result, we have a tremendously talented core of service members. And from talent management standpoint, I think our, our imperative is really to make sure that we are mining, managing, and developing that talent and helping all our people achieve their potential. And I think in doing so, that only makes us stronger, it only makes us, it only makes us better. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we need to do to continue to have an effective force both, both today and in the future. 
you know, I mean, our people, you know, I mean, we can, you know, for whatever technologies we have, whatever systems we have, none of it matters at all without our people. And so I think, you know, I, I think it's incumbent upon us really to really double down on making sure we're doing an effective job managing them and putting them in the best positions to succeed. And I think in doing that, that's the way we get to the strongest force we can have. Dr. Schaefer? I am so, so glad you asked this <laughs> question. Um, because I, my mission um, has been to try to connect the operational readiness piece with the personnel piece. Uh, I started out as a strategist um, and then picked up the, the personnel portfolio. So uh, I intuitively look at everything through a readiness lens. Um, and right now, in this moment of time, our people are key to readiness. It doesn't matter how many tanks we have. If we don't have the people who are trained and don't have the people to drive them or shoot them, it's just a tin can. Um, and so all of these things that we have been talking about touch on that operational readiness piece. Um, and you know, looking out, trying to build the, uh, the army of 2030 and 2040, that is key in my mind every day, every hour of every day. And I think it's interesting that you know, today being the anniversary of D-Day that a number of things went wrong, right? The plans didn't always work the way they were supposed to, the equipment didn't always work the way it was supposed to, um, but it was the training of the people carrying out those plans and using those weapons and the ingenuity and the ability to, to thrive and, and the will to fight in, in those moments that actually made the difference. So not to be too on the nose about the, the anniversary. Um, well, I would like to thank our panelists. I think it's a rare opportunity that we get to see the three of you together in an open, <laughs> honest conversation about the proactive things that each of your departments and the services that fall underneath are doing. So we really appreciate having the three of you together. Um, um, for those of you watching at home, our next panel, uh, exploring the international connections between domestic violent extremist groups, will begin at 2.25 with our uh, program director, Carrie Cordero. And please join us uh, for, for that panel here in about a half an hour. So thank you all. Thank you.